Some friends, right? Uh, a quantum invention. Look, I'll tell you what this, Jim. This is like probably one of the most the coolest titles ever, right? A quantum evangelist, right? <laughs> Who is that? Right? No, you you are everywhere. You're a quantum evangelist. That's so cool. So with you guys, my good friend, quantum evangelist from IBM, James Weaver. Oh, uh, thank you, my friend. And the internet goes crazy oh, for no. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, my friend. Yes, it's Thank an honor know. to be here, and and uh, I love hanging out with you and all of my good friends in Brazil, uh, Yara and and Joao uh, Santana and 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 all of that. I just have so many friends there, and and it's always a, a really great pleasure. Uh, so today, as you mentioned, um, uh, as Bruno mentioned, I'm going to talk about quantum computing for classical developers. I think probably about everybody here is a classical developer. And um, what I'm going to do is, is give you some, help you take some baby steps to uh, becoming a quantum developer, programming quantum computers. But first I'm going to uh, uh, show you some uh, pictures of uh, quantum computers and some diagrams and things like that to help you with the concepts. So I'm going to open up a, a slide deck here and uh, show you a little presentation. And we'll start at the beginning. All right, so Jim, if you don't mind, I'm gonna be monitoring the, the chat here. So if anyone has any questions, I'll, 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 I'll transfer to Jim, right, so. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, so uh, these slides, by the way, are at this URL. Qisk.it slash blocks. And so uh, that's how you can find this presentation and all the resources that we've got here. Uh, my name is James Weaver. I'm a longtime Java developer, Java champion. I've written several books, mostly about Java and Raspberry Pi and Java FX and things like that. Uh, my email address is james.weaver at ibm.com. And you can always find me on Twitter at JavaFExpert. Uh, JavaFExpert. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to give you an introduction to quantum computing, and then we're going to go into a an area that is underneath where quantum, uh, you know, is is the infrastructure, uh, is the is the platform underneath quantum computing. And that's something that's actually in nature called quantum mechanics. So I'm going to be talking of the axioms of quantum mechanics, but I'm going to do it in a fun way with, with cats. Then I'm going to show you a game that I created. It's like uh, Minecraft and uh, Portal that you can run to help you learn about quantum computing and Qiskit, which is our open source quantum computing framework. And then I'm going to show you how to use an IBM, a real IBM quantum computer, so you can run quantum programs on a real quantum computer in the cloud for free. So where are we at today with quantum computing? And actually, we're kind of where we're at with classical computing back in around the 1940s. Now, none of you were alive in the 1940s, I'm sure. I wasn't. but from what I understand, and these pictures that that the computers back then were brand new, they took up large rooms, they had a very small number of bits storage, and software was brand new. So that's where we are today. Here on the right, we have a quantum computer. Quantum computers uh, can take up large rooms and they have a limited number of quantum bits. And again, the software is brand new. Now this is a picture, this is some of my colleagues here, and this is a picture of an IBM quantum computer. And that, that can there, the, 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 uh, the cream colored can is actually a refrigerator. It's a dilution refrigerator. And so the, 
circuits in here, all the electronics and hardware in here in that computer go into that can. They close the can up and they cool it down to almost absolute zero, about 15 millikelvin, which is colder than outer space. It's it's like the coldest place in the universe um, is in the bottom of this quantum computer. So what makes quantum computers special? What is the difference between quantum computing and classical computing? Well, again, classical computers use underneath, it uses transistors and everything is a bit. Right? So the abstraction is on and off. Now, quantum computers, the underneath it is, is these, th this quantum computer, but then which relies on quantum physics. So it's able to use quantum mechanical phenomenon, such as things that I'll talk about in a little bit, superposition, interference, and entanglement. And so it uses those quantum mechanical phenomenon to perform operations on data. So it's a whole new way of thinking about computing uh, that we'll discuss. Uh, last year, we announced a Q, IBM Q System 1 at a consumer electronics show. It's in a nice, pretty nine foot by nine foot by nine foot, uh, you know, one, uh, you know, one meter square uh, or three feet by three feet by three feet, one meter square um, enclosure. So why would we use a quantum computer? Well, some problems can be solved exponentially faster. So over here, if we see the solutions to problems, some problems are feasible to be solved on classical computers, but some problems will never be able to solve on classical computers, but they will be feasible on quantum computers because some problems can be solved exponentially faster. So here's an example, the, the traveling salesman problem. Uh, and you probably know about the traveling salesman problem where you have lots of different cities and the salesperson has to find an optimal route between the cities, perhaps optimizing for distance or fuel consumption or time. And that particular problem grows exponentially with the, with the input size, with the number of cities. And so if you get more than 50 or 60 cities, then you can no longer solve it reliably with a classical computer because you run out of memory. Um, so the, the first purpose the you know the reason that we um, are challenged to make a quantum computer and to do quantum computer uh, computing was actually uh, the challenge was given by this person right here his name is dr richard feynman and he said something back in 1981 he said nature isn't classical and if you want to make a simulation of nature you'd better make it quantum mechanical. Uh, and by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. Um, and it's not easy. It's, uh, it's very hard actually to make a quantum computer. But if you want to simulate nature, you have to do it quantum mechanically. Nature is not classical. And so I'm gonna talk about why you can't do it classically in a minute. But if you've ever watched the Big Bang Theory, uh, you know this is Sheldon. And there was an episode in which he was playing the bongo drums. And he was actually honoring Dr. Richard Feynman, who has you know since passed on, uh, because he used to like to play bongo drums and congas. Some of you may remember that episode. So on the subject of chemistry then, being able to simulate nature, the best supercomputer in the world 
can only simulate about a 40 to 50 electron orbital system uh, in, um, you know, in a, in a 40 to 50 electron orbital system, which is a pretty small molecule. Uh, there are 40 to 50 quantum particles. And so we're trying to then be able to model these quantum particles so that we can predict how uh, the chemical reactions, for example, if we want to discover new drugs um, or if we want to feed the world uh, more efficiently, you know, uh, food production more efficient. Um, we need to be able to accurately model nature, but we can only do it about 40 to 50 electrons. And the reason why is that for every quantum particle, um, if we're trying to do that with a classical computer, for every quantum particle that we add, it doubles the size of the problem. So, um, we in quantum computing, we use this term called qubits, quantum bits. And a quantum bit can be represented by with two complex terms. But if we want to track two quantum particles, then we need four complex terms. So in, in, uh, in a language like Java or whatever, that would be uh, two, e each complex terms takes two double precision numbers, one for the real number and one for the imaginary part. And so here, that would take about eight double precision numbers. This one, if we go up to three qubits, that's 16 double precision numbers um, and on and on. So if we got up to, um, let's say uh, 53, then that's two to the 53rd power of complex numbers. And classically, uh, you run out of memory. You, you just can't go much farther than that, maybe 53 or 54. But that's where we are right now with quantum computers. We're, we're, we're building uh, quantum computers that we're testing and allowing our customers to use that have 53, 54 qubits and growing. And so we're, we're starting to cross the threshold to where uh, we'll be able to uh, model and do things quantumly that we can't do classically, again, like modeling nature. Now, when we get to a large number, even let's say a molecule that has 300 electron orbital system, that takes two to the 300th power of complex numbers. And to put that in perspective, two to the 300th power is more basis states than there are atoms in the observable universe. So you can see why when you get past, uh, you know, 54 quantum particles or so that you're trying to model, you just run out of memory. But if you have a quantum computer, and as we keep adding quantum bits to our quantum computers and that we're able to reliably compute with them, then we can have a, a qubit, a quantum particle inside the quantum computer that models a quantum particle outside the quantum computer. For example, when we're trying to model chemical compounds. And so as we add uh, quantum particles inside the quantum computer, we can we can uh, we can do phenomenal processing problems uh, as far as modeling quantum uh, modeling uh, molecules on the outside. So one thing that got us really excited about quantum computing was in 1994. This person named uh, Peter, Dr. Peter Shore. Those uh, those of you that uh, um, uh, that have had careers in Java, you may think that this is uh, James Gosling, but it's not. It's Dr. Dr. Peter Shore. Uh, they do resemble each other a little bit, I think. Um, and he said uh, he's got this algorithm called Shore's algorithm that you can um, uh, factor 
numbers, large numbers into two prime numbers exponentially faster than you can do classically. And so RSA cryptography uses that, the fact that it's very hard to factor large numbers into two prime numbers, it uses that for security. If you have a large enough number, say a two or three or four or 500 uh, digit number, it may take you hundreds of years to do that prime factorization. But with RSA or with uh, Shor's algorithm, there is a, a really hard part of that algorithm uh, uh, the, you know, of factoring numbers called period finding that can be done exponentially faster. And so he found a way to do that with a quantum algorithm. And so, you know, a few years, a couple decades, whatever, um, then we need to have identified other ways of doing cryptography because at some point we'll cross that threshold to where we'll be easily and quickly factoring really, really large numbers. So the next year, uh, Dr. Love Grover in, in um, 1995 created something called Grover's algorithm. And so it, it's a way to quickly search unsorted data. And he made an interesting observation. He said, programming a quantum computer is particularly interesting since there are multiple things happening in the same hardware simultaneously. One needs to think both like a theoretical physicist and a computer scientist. The algorithms, uh, you know, we're all used to creating algorithms or writing programs that implement algorithms. But with quantum computers, you also need to think a little bit like a, a physicist because underneath it all is quantum mechanics. Um, so here's just an example of, uh, of a problem that uses Grover's algorithm. Uh, let's say that you are going to invite people to a party and we'll just take a small, uh, a small problem here. Let's say you have four friends, Alice, Bob, Carol, and David, and you're going to invite them to a party. The problem is Alice and Bob, they're in a relationship. Carol and David are in a relationship, but Alice and David had a bad breakup a while back. And so you couldn't possibly invite them to the same party because they're not speaking to, to each other. And so that becomes a Boolean satisfiability problem where you have a logical expression and then you need to be able to, to substitute these Boolean variables with either true or false individually and find out which ones are true. And so that, that scales up with the problem size as well with four variables, then we have two to the, six, two to the, fourth, uh, two to the fourth possibilities. And so 16 combinations, that's, you know, that can, you can go through those pretty quickly. But what if you had 300 variables and we, your problem size is two to the 300th power, which again is, is, is more than the, uh, that's more combinations than the visible atoms in the universe. What are you going to do there? You can't possibly, you know, you, the universe will uh, uh, will die out probably before you uh, before you count go through all those combinations. So what do you do? Well, you can use, you know, when we when we build quantum computers powerful enough to enable this, you can use Grover search, which is uh, part of Grover's algorithm, and uh, this is uh, this link here, this Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebooks are, are ones that you can, uh, they're kind of like worksheets that have programs in them. And so I could go here to this Jupyter Notebook uh, that has Grover's, uh, Grover's search example. And then this is in the IBM Quantum Experience, which is a, a, a cloud-based IDE, really, for quantum computing. 
And so this sets up the problem, tells you about the problem. And then we can run each cell of this. Here we just do some imports. This is Python. And then here we're going to set up that logical expression that I just showed you. And then we'll run Grover's algorithm on that logical expression. And then we'll run it on a, a quantum simulator. And then here we can plot the results. And so this tells us in these uh, these bit strings, by the way, that's the one, the least significant bit is Alice and then Bob and then Carol and then David. And so it's telling us with Grover's algorithm on a, using a quantum algorithm that we could invite Alice and Bob or Alice, Bob and Carol or Carol and David or Bob, Carol and David. But those are the only four possibilities, the only four combinations of people we could invite. So that's an example of a quantum algorithm, and uh, we'll get more into those things soon. I think I yes. think I think this might be a good moment for for us uh, a few questions here. Uh, Absolutely. Um, so first of all, uh, Hattie has a comment that says quantum computer sounds like the stuff of science fiction, <laughs> and I think I think that is uh, that is very very true. You can comment a little bit on that, but. Uh, the question that, that we got here from Constantine and also from John, I think that uh, are like more practical questions, right? So Constantine says that he's doing a, t a thesis on machine learning area, and uh, you know, so so they want to, he wants to extract the corpus of medical handwritten paper, right? So do you think that quantum computing can be uh, a good way to do that uh, maybe in the future? And also John says, can this be used to, for scheduling? With limited resource, so I think they are asking more practical questions on on, on how they can can be used in co quantum computing. That's perfect. Those are perfect questions for this slide. Um, so maybe they've seen my slides before because because this slide talks about exactly those things. <laughs> so so I know that they're tracking with my presentation. Uh, congratulations, Constantine, and uh, you say Joe. John, 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 so, John. Yeah. yes. Constantine John. and John, and the comment, the comment from about science fiction was from Ehad, from Hadi. Hadi, yes. Okay, uh, let me address the one about science fiction first. It's kind of, um, it's kind of interesting. It feels like science fiction, right? But it's actually, we're actually just leveraging what was baked into the universe, baked into nature when it was created, right? So, so these, these quantum mechanical properties are, are baked into nature. And so we're just leveraging those. So yeah, it's science fiction. It seems like science fiction in the future, but it's only because uh, physicists are beginning to really discover and leverage what's been in nature all along. So it's kind of, it's kind of a little bit poetic there. Uh, as far as applications of quantum computing, uh, one of uh, Constantine asked about machine learning. And as you know, machine learning, uh, uh, like a neural network, when you try to solve a supervised learning problem, you're actually bringing the features in, like the uh, a data set, the features in a data set. And you are putting them into a high dimensional space so that then you can distinguish between uh, and do classification. So you put them in a high dimensional data set and then, uh, sorry, uh, dimensional spaces, and then you draw decision boundaries between between the uh, the things you're trying to classify. And if you throw them into a high enough dimensional space, then you can very easily see the uh, distinctions between them and then do the classification. And so then the neural network, uh, you are doing uh, forward and back propagation then to try to tune the weights and biases in the neural network to then be able to um, to do the classification. So 
in quantum computing, uh, what I just talked about a little bit ago about these high dimensional spaces, these ultra high dimensional spaces, you know, two to the 300, whatever, you know, if you have, uh, uh, if you have uh, 300 quantum particles or qubits that you're dealing with. So you can use a similar technique. That's some of the things that we're looking at and, and prototyping and demonstrating now is the ability to put these features into what's called a, a Hilbert space, which is basically a high dimensional complex vector space. And so we put these features in there and then we use a similar technique to draw decision boundaries between them and classify them. And so it's a very similar process, only you're leveraging quantum computing so that so that uh, so that now the uh, the height you can really reach much higher dimensions and um, uh, and once quantum computers get larger, then be able to solve uh, classification problems and other kinds of problems uh, lots faster, uh, bigger ones faster. Another one is. Uh, as John asked about, was optimization and scheduling and things like that. Scheduling is is an optimization problem. And so you're trying to optimize your resources uh, within constraints and, and things like that. And so, um, uh, so here is a, a link to, on this slide, to something called a max cut application. And a max cut is, is an optimization problem. Uh, that scales up exponentially, and you're trying to then, um, like with a graph here, maybe you have a graph that has nodes and edges, lines between them, and those edges have weights on them. And what you're trying to do then is you're trying to separate these nodes into two groups, a red group and a blue group. And you separate them in such a way that the lines between them, between the different groups, are maximized. That's why it's called a max cut. You're you're separating reds and blues. You're separating the you know the nodes into two groups, and then you're cutting them across and trying to make sure that the the you're getting the maximum cut. And so this program uses uh, quantum algorithms to be able to do that optimization. And so scheduling, like you said, uh, you know, like a classic scheduling problem is called the nurse scheduling problem to where you're, you're trying to get uh, schedule nurses in a hospital to be able to cover a certain number of shifts and there's lots of different constraints. That is a combinatorial optimization problem that is well suited for quantum computers. Um, other areas we've already talked about are chemistry. Here's one, uh, uh, finance. If you think about financial applications, they are optimization problems. You're trying to, in some cases, maybe optimize a portfolio. So here's an application that uses our quantum computing framework underneath. It's just a demo application. But we can, uh, I'll randomize uh, a portfolio here. And uh, so these are, these are our, our stocks, our, our assets. And here are our um, estimated uh, returns on investment as far as uh, percentage of interest or whatever. And then these are the covariances, so the, the correlations between one asset and another asset. Sometimes it's a negative correlation. So if you take, if you put all these those things together, um, then, and you say, okay, I want to, I've got a budget to buy three assets, and I have a very low appetite for risk, and I could say optimize. Then it uses a quantum algorithm underneath to um, uh, to figure out that problem to, to suggest what things to buy. I had timed out, so I'm going to go ahead and do that again. We sort of randomize that, going to get three assets. Maybe I have a risk, a risk appetite for zero. 
and then I say optimize, and it suggests that maybe I should buy Acme Burns and Cheers. Um, and it's telling me that because those are the highest, and I have no appetite for risk, so those are the highest returns on investment. But in some cases, if I if I said, you know, I have a higher appetite for risk, in some cases, not this particular case, but in some cases, it actually might um, suggest other combinations. Like example, this was a little closer to uh, maybe maybe seven, if these were a little more attractive and I had a risk appetite of 10, it might, because of the covariances, it might suggest different things. And so that's another kind of optimization problem. So those are all areas that are good in the near term for quantum computing. There's this thing called NISC era, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And that's where we're at right now. Our, the quantum computers we're creating are, um, are noisy, right? They're not perfect yet. They do have some noise. Uh, it it uh, it relies on us to be able to control nature. We need to be able to control the quantum particles uh, the, uh, that are inside the computer, and that is a very uh, very hard thing to do to do accurately. And so there is some noise inherently there. Uh, we also call it intermediate scale because. We don't have a lot of uh, quantum particles in our quantum computers yet. We have, you know, 40 or 50 or, or maybe more. But that's, you know, we need to get to thousands and hundreds of thousands. So we're, we're just the beginning. We're in this intermediate scale. But even in this era of noisy and intermediate scale quantum computers, we can uh, apply, play with the... Uh, algorithms like this and get pretty good results with with smaller problems. And as we then grow our quantum computers, we'll be able to uh, continue to to grow these problems and their results. Now, classical computers aren't going away anytime soon. So we still need classical computers, high performance classical computers. But when we want to do something where there's, uh, where there's an advantage for doing it with a quantum computer, like for example, some chemistry problem or a optimization problem that has lots of, um, you know, a big problem space, then we, we might say, you know, Let's go, let's farm that out, kind of like we would to a GPU, a graphical processing unit, only we're going to uh, farm it out to a QPU, a quantum processing unit. And so then it can do that really hard thing that it does and then come back with the, with the answer and then continue uh, doing it classically. Um, so what I'd like to do now is take you through some axioms of quantum mechanics. And it's, you know, you don't have to understand everything about how a, uh, all the electronics and transistors in a regular classical computer to be able to program it. But it is kind of nice to, to know what's going on down there. And, and especially when it has to do with the bits and turning things and on, on and off and, and uh, some of the gates. And so what I'm going to do is kind of do that same kind of thing, cover that same kind of basic uh, information only with quantum mechanics, which again is what underlies quantum computers. But I'm gonna do it in a friendly way with, uh, with Grumpy Cat. So I'm gonna tell you a little story. It's not a true story, but it's, it's, a, it's a fun little story about my pet cat. So I have this microscopic cat, and sometimes he's grumpy, and sometimes he's happy. But I've never seen him in between those two states. Anytime I observe my cat, he's either grumpy or he's happy. And so that leads me to axiom one. It's called the superposition principle. 
And the superposition principle says that my cat can be in any combination of grumpy and cat and happy, not just grumpy or 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 just grumpy or just happy, but in any combination in the quantum world. Now, in the classical world, when I actually view my cat, my cat then collapses to one of these two states, happy or grumpy. But before I look at my cat in a microscope, my cat is in any one of these states, actually anywhere on this unit circle. So here, my cat, if I saw my cat, if my cat was in this state, he's in an equal combination of grumpiness and happiness. And uh, so here we would say he's in an equal superposition of grumpy and happy. And so he could be anywhere on that. So now um, that gets me to how we could represent quantum states. And we can represent quantum states geometrically. Like, for example, if this is a two-dimensional plane, just a Cartesian plane, and this is a unit circle, the, on the x-axis we have um, a one here. This grumpy is, this point right here, is one on the grumpy axis and zero on the happy axis. Yeah, one on the x-axis, zero on the on the y-axis. And so we could represent that geometrically by this point on that circle. We could represent it in a vector, uh, as a one-dimensional array, if you will, with a one in the grumpy and zero on the happy. Same thing with, with a happy cat. I could represent happy state as zero on the grumpy axis and one on the happy axis. And so that would be zero and one. But then, so that's all classical. But let's say in the quantum world, before I observe my cat, my cat could be in this state, for example, right here on the unit circle. Now that is in this linear combination, mathematicians would say a linear combination of uh, of grumpy, some some uh, uh, some coefficient of grumpy and some coefficient of happy. In this case, it happens to be uh, the square root of one third grumpy and the square root of two thirds happy. And so that puts them right here. So over here in this vector, we could represent them with square root of one third grumpy, square root of two thirds happy. We could also represent them in something called Dirac notation. Dirac notation was invented by a physicist named Paul, Dr. Paul Dirac. And here it's just, we're just putting the coefficients and putting some funny looking um, symbols here. We're saying, the square root of one third uh, coefficient on the grumpy axis, and then plus the square root of two thirds on the happy axis. So the reason why we say plus is because it's in a positive direction. So square root of one third on the grumpy axis plus in the positive direction up, square root of two thirds on the happy axis. So that's three different ways of representing our quantum states uh, when they're behaving quantumly before we before we observe them, before we measure them. So that's the first axiom. The second axiom is something called unitary evolution. And quantum states can evolve. And when in a quantum computer, just like classical computers, we use thing called, things called gates. And we can model those gates as linear algebra matrices. So here, for example, we have a grumpy cat and we want to make our grumpy cat happy. So we can apply an X gate. And that's very much like a classical not gate, only in quantum computing, we model as, as a matrix. And in this case, an X gate is modeled as this matrix. And then, so we already know 
that we can represent a grumpy cat with one on the grumpy axis, zero on the happy axis. And then if we multiply that vector by that matrix, then we get this result, which is a happy cat, zero on the grumpy axis, one on the happy axis. A little trick so that you can do this in your head is that if you have a vector that's called a one hot vector, which is a one in one of the elements and a zero in all the rest of the elements, if you want to multiply it by a matrix, then you just identify which row the one is in. Well, it's in the top row, it's in the first row. So you can just pick out the corresponding column. So it's in that, you pick out this column, this first column, and that's the answer. So as quantum states evolve, as you want them to evolve, then that, that can be modeled with a matrix. And so that was a kind of a classical example, still dealing with classical states. But we can put a cat into a quantum state that is an equal superposition. Remember that one on the, on the unit circle where we have this equal superposition of, of grumpy and happy. So we can do that by putting them through a Hadamard gate. Um, and a Hadamard gate can also be modeled as a matrix. So here we have the Hadamard gate, uh, the matrix here. Here we have a grumpy cat. And then if we multiply that vector by that matrix, we pick out the first column of the matrix, put it over here, and we see that the answer is that equal superposition of grumpy and happy. So that's the unitary evolution ax axiom. So you're doing very well. You've, you've got three, uh, two of the three axioms underneath your belt. And now we're going to talk about axiom three, and that's measurement. So axiom three says that the probability that you'll see a grumpy cat or a happy cat is simply the amplitude or this, this coefficient squared. So if we have this quantum state, and if the probability of seeing a grumpy cat is this coefficient or this amplitude squared. Well, how would we square that amplitude? Well, we could just take away the radical, right? Because this is taking the square root of one third. So we'll just take away that radical. And now we've just squared the, the coefficient. And so we can say that when, a, when we observe this cat, that there, there's gonna be a one third probability that we'll see a grumpy cat. And there's a two third probability that we'll see a happy cat. So that's the measurement axiom. And we could have multiple cats. Here we have two cats and two, two cats are actually the product of, of, uh, of, of this cat and that cat. And so we're doing something called taking a tensor product or a Kronecker product of those two states, which is nothing more than, it's a little bit like the FOIL method in, uh, in when you're solving algebra problems, we're going to multiply this, this uh, element by this element and we get this one. And then we'll continue to cross multiply and we get zeros for the rest of them. So we say that, that this quantum state, this, this grumpy, grumpy quantum state can be represented with this matrix, one, zero, zero, zero with the one corresponding to this binary progression of cats in which the first one is, is uh, grumpy, grumpy. And we can do the same thing with, let's say, uh, we've got another composite quantum state, grumpy and happy. And it's the same kind of operation, only it's zero, one, zero, zero. That's the one is, uh, is positioned here. And then uh, we could put all those things together and say, well, maybe we start with two grumpy cats. And, you know, we're not showing the quantum gates here, but let's say that we put them through some quantum gates. And now we end up with, with this state, and then maybe some more quantum gates. And we measure with, uh, and if we had uh, this, uh, 
quantum state here, there's one half probability that when we look at this, um, this quantum state, that it will measure, it'll measure as grumpy and happy. Here, there's a one sixth probability that we'll see the cat on the left being happy and the cat on the right being grumpy. And then a one third probability that they'll both be happy. And then there's the entanglement. Now, Einstein, uh, back in uh, 1935 and, and later, he used to call this uh, spooky actions at a distance. He never really did believe that, um, that, that there is really this quantum phenomenon called entanglement, where you could entangle two quantum particles and then separate them with a large distance. And then when you measure one, uh, then you automatically know, even if it's thousands of miles away, you automatically know what the other one is going to collapse as when you measure that one. And so that's called quantum entanglement. And we rely upon that in quantum computing. Um, and so applying that to our cats, let's say we have two cats, Alice and, and Bob, and we're going to model this on a quantum circuit diagram. So here's the input states. And then here are the wires that are going to show the quantum evolution of our, of our state. So Alice, for example, we're going to put her through a Hadamard gate. You remember Hadamard gates put cats into equal superpositions. So we see Alice there in an equal superposition of grumpy and happy. And then we're going to use a two qubit gate, very similar to a, you know, like a conditional not gate. It is a conditional not gate to where it's going to flip. This is like an X gate here. It's going to flip the Bob's state based upon Alice's state. So whenever Alice is happy, it's going to flip Bob's state. So the net result is we have this state called the Bell state or one of the Bell states in which there's actually an equal superposition of the grumpy, grumpy state and the happy, happy state. And there are no other possibilities. When you observe this quantum uh, state, when I observe my, when I observe Alice and Bob, um, they're gonna either collapse as both being grumpy as, or both being happy. Those are the only two combinations. So let's say that, that Alice gets in a spaceship and goes to Venus and Bob gets in a spaceship and goes to Mars. When, if we observe Alice on Venus, then there's a 100% probability that Bob, when we observe Bob on Mars, that he's happy. Uh, conversely, if we observe Bob, let's say on Mars, and he's grumpy, then we know that when we observe Alice, that she'll be grumpy as well. And here are, here are the matrices that model these gates. This is a two by two matrix, remember, that models a, a one qubit gate. Here's a two qubit gate. And so we, have to, we need a four by four matrix to model that one. Um, so I wanted to, in the, in the remaining minutes I have, I wanted to show you a couple of resources. Uh, one of those resources is this quantum computing game that I've created called Kizkit Blocks. And uh, you can find that at the, where you can find the rest of these resources uh, that I showed you at the beginning of the, um, of the presentation. And so, that's, uh, this is the site. This is my site for Kizkit Blocks. And uh, this site is, um, is that, uh, is this site right here. I'll go ahead and go back to it so that you can uh, know where it is. So Jim, uh, maybe, maybe, yes. maybe that's a good time for another, some other questions and comments here. Yes, please, please. Uh, yes. So lots of people talk about, uh, you know how quantum computing can affect things, right? So, yes. uh, so for example, John McCarty says, could you use it to pick uh, lottery numbers if you had a large enough set of previous results and the same machines 
and balls were used, for example. And also, uh, John McCarthy asks, what effects will quantum computer have on Bitcoin? And then had he <laughs> complements that, looks like those dramatic effects, those uh, this dram dramatically affect the new security of some encryption alg algorithms. So, yeah, as far as like uh, picking lottery numbers, I'm not sure. That's that's a good question. Or Bitcoin, I don't know enough about Bitcoin to to really uh, uh, to be able to address that. Um, uh, to the effect, uh, to the extent that uh, um, you know, maybe a lottery problem could be. Um, uh, formulated as a machine learning problem, um, then, uh, uh, you know, then possibly, but, uh, if the lottery is completely random, then I don't know how you would, uh, how you would do that. Um, as far as, um, uh, the, so, so the second one, the second question was what, sorry. <laughs> what was the second well, question? That will affect dramatically, uh, security algorithms. Cryptography. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so it'll affect them because of uh, Shor's algorithm, because we'll be able to, um, you know, Shor's, uh, the RSA encryption is dependent upon not being able to uh, factor a large number into two primes very quickly. But then with quantum computing, we will increasingly be able to do that more quickly because we can do it exponentially faster. And so as quantum computers uh, grow in size and reliability, uh, at some point I predict that we will uh, break RSA encryption. Now there are ways of uh, using quantum computing to encrypt things. There's initiatives, for example, a quantum internet, right? Quantum networks and uh, uh, um, distributing uh, keys, uh, public and private keys, um, actually, you know, uh, a lot uh, with um, uh, quantum computing and um, and quantum networks, and so there are there are things that we're doing to address that, um, and uh, you know, to be able to substitute RSA for encryption for something uh, for something quantum. Uh, very good insights and questions. So here's the site, Kizkit Blocks, uh, that you can go to. That'll get you right here. And then this explains um, how to download and install Kizkit Blocks. There's a little video demo, et cetera. But I want to show you this real quick because it's a game that I think will be very useful in learning and gaining uh, intuition about quantum computing. So here is uh, here's the game. You go in, in here and it's like Minecraft. It's a little bit like Minecraft, a little bit like uh, Portal. And so you can go in, explore. Let's say you wanna know what an H gate does, a Hadamard gate, and we can read information about it. And when you get in there, um, up in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, there's always some instructions uh, that disappear after a while. But the instructions told me to go into this TARDIS now in this TARDIS from Doctor Who, uh, there's actually a portal hub. So if I go in here, then there's this portal hub. And I've got different levels, kind of like in portal. And so I can jump in this level and I can, uh, and I'm in this room that I have to figure out how to escape from. And um, to do that, uh, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, there's some clues. Professor Q, which is over, who's over there, is saying, uh, hello, I'm um, going to try an experiment. Uh, for this experiment, change the quantum state of the circuit, this circuit, to the same state as shown on the wall. And so to solve that, let's see, I want to get that state. So I want the liquid block to be above this one. And so I can go over to this chest, pull out the X gate, and then come over here and then throw the X gate by right clicking it. And then that turns that state from a zero to a one here. And the block turns gold and, uh, and then we can go to the next room. So that's one resource I wanted to show you. And another uh, uh, resource, uh, because this resource, there's uh, at least two different levels now with uh, 
16 rooms in each one, and it progressively teaches you in a very fun way um, uh, uh, about quantum computing. But another resource then is in the presentation, and that is this uh, IBM Q experience, our quantum experience. And if I go back to uh, one of these slides here, um, we can go to this uh, quantum experience. And, um, uh, and so there's a, a, a link to go to that. And here's the link right here. Um, and we can see that when we get in there, that uh, we have access to some real quantum computers. So for example, this IBM Q underscore London, it's a quantum computer that has five qubits. We can use it for free. And we could go in and um, we could, for example, go into the, the, the notebook, the, com the composer, and we could uh, uh, create a quantum circuit by dragging and dropping gates, let's say uh, an X gate onto the form. We can go over here and run it. You can see all sorts of different visualizations of the state. So I wanted to introduce you to those uh, resources. And so I know we're out of time. I don't want to take anything away from, uh, I want you to be able to go to the next sessions that you would like to go to. But Jim, please, uh, yes. So yes. Let, let me tell you one thing. We have a room. I'm not sure if you have time now, but we have. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, we have a room for you that yes. if you want to answer questions. You can go to the sessions and go, go to your room and, and be there and you can answer questions as long as you want. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, we'll show you stuff and we'll just keep going, maybe play the game or whatever, as long as people are interested in. So, All right. Yeah, I'll go to that room now. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your for your attention and participation. No problem. Jim, awesome, man. Thanks a lot. Look, I love it. There's one last question here that John is asking. Will programming quantum computers make me rich? So if you wanna if you wanna know this question, John, because then James is gonna actually tell you how to be rich by programming quantum computer, because I think it's a new technology, right? So there's a, there's a lot of potential there, right, Jim? I think there is. Some of the some of the uh, highest paid people in uh, in technology right now, as far as like uh, uh, technologists, are in machine learning, right? They're paid like uh, rock stars and. Uh, and professional athletes and i think the same thing will be true in quantum computing yep All right.